This is the meditation on the resurrection of our divine Savior. Following the exercises of St. Ignatius, we have about 22 young men on this retreat. And tomorrow ends the retreat. And tonight there'll be, as usual, the first Friday all night adoration. Come and adore our Lord, come and make reparation. And this is towards the end of the five-day retreat. And you have just contemplated today the, the crucifixion, the death of our Lord, and his brutal death, three hours of excruciating pain on the cross. And the seven last words of our Lord, and that our Lord died on the cross, roaring, like the lion of the tribe of Judah, he roared the victory over Satan. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then he bowed his head and died. And then Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus came, took his body down from the cross, and they placed his sacred body all mangled, all torn up, and gouged, crowned with thorns and laid him in the arms of the Blessed Mother. Blessed Mother, how can we ever address you? How can we ever approach you? Christ gave us yourself to be our mother. And we turn to you, our Blessed Mother. This is what we've done to your son. This is our work. It's been my work. All our sins. This is what we did to you. This is what we did to the living God in the flesh. And she holds that trophy. It's a trophy mangled and dead. But it's a trophy of love. It's a trophy of justice. Because sin is no joke. And this is what the Son took from the Father, the, the violent lightning bolts of God's justice he took on the cross. And the Virgin Mary holds this divine son. What passed through her mind as she held the child Jesus in her arms? She saw his hands. She would have remembered those little hands of the child in Bethlehem, the little hands of the child on the flight to Egypt. And she saw those hands and those little feet grow from boyhood to manhood. And the Virgin Mary, what must have been her thoughts, thinking of Nazareth, thinking of watching the lamb being sacrificed every year in Jerusalem. She knew what it meant. Every year she was preparing for this hour, and now it came. And her heart bleeds. Her tears flow like rivers. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, look and see if there is any sorrow like under my sorrow. Deep as the sea is, my, is thy woe, O oh, daughter of Sion. Who can console thee, O daughter of Jerusalem, says this, the Holy Ghost, foretelling this event. So the Blessed Virgin Mary, she held that body, that trophy, in our work. And he literally was, as Isaiah says, the man of sorrows mangled from head to foot. From head to foot, the crown of his head, crowned with thorns to the bottom of his feet, mangled, burned and bleeding with the nail through the foot to both feet. So Our Lady, she accompanies the body of our Lord, carried by St. John and the men, and the ladies with the Virgin Mary accompany the body of our Lord to the tomb. And he's laid in the tomb, and she washes his body with her tears. They don't have much for aloes, it's short. It's, uh, they have to get Finish before the Sabbath sets in, which is about 5 o'clock in the evening on Good Friday. 
The Blessed Mother, her heart is torn <coughs> from her son. She'd rather be buried with him. She'd rather just stay with him. Because all she knows with us men is the violent attacks against her son by our sins, by our many, many sins of the whole human race. There's no one she can be friends with here on this earth. No one understands, no one can breathe that pure, fresh air of a soul and a heart that loved God like the Virgin Mary in our Lord. So her only love has gone, gone. And she, there is only darkness for her left in this world. But she accepts this cross. She drinks the chalice. And we could even say she drinks twice a chalice. Because all that night on Good Friday, she lived through the whole passion. She didn't sleep that night. All she heard was the blasphemies, the screams, and even worse, the pounding of the nails, the whips of the scourges, tearing out chunks of our Lord's divine flesh. Flesh of his flying through the air in streams of blood flowing from his face, flowing from his shoulders, his whole body raked. That's all she could hear, that's all she could see. What mother wouldn't? And then hearing him panting for air on the cross. You know that crucifixion was a position of asphyxiation, it was a position of suffocation. You can't breathe. I won't go through all the details, but the details are so vivid that doctors and surgeons who have studied the shroud have broken down in tears studying it. And one Dr. Barbet who studies it, he was a good Catholic man, and he said he can never finish the Stations of the Cross because the image of the shroud so imprinted in his memory and mind the medical angle of the suffering of our Divine Lord, let alone the suffering in his Divine Heart and the thirst that he expressed from the cross, I thirst. And he thirsts for souls, thirsts for our intelligence to seek him, our, our heart to love him, your manly strength, you men, to serve him, to serve your king. Lay your weapons before him like the knights of old and, and ask his strength to use your gifts, your talents, your strength, your talents, and skills, whatever, lay them at the service of your king and consecrate all of yourselves to our Blessed Mother. Give yourselves to her and she'll take you right to her son. So what happens at three o'clock? Our Lord dies on the cross. But as the Psalm says, Psalm 18, he is the giant running the way. He's not, he doesn't have time to waste. He works the redemption. And part of it is to tend to the souls in limbo. The fathers, Adam and Eve, Ruth, Sarah, Judah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, a hundred years before who foretold so many details of the Passion. And Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, the Maccabees, and then all the millions of saints who are down in limbo who are expecting and waiting. And remember at the death of St. Joseph, St. Joseph arrived at the gates of Limbo. And this brought great joy to the saints, knowing they could hear from St. Joseph's mouth the childhood and the infancy and already the persecutions unleashed against Christ the King as a baby, as a child. And St. Joseph tells them and they're expecting this, this day of the redemption. So at three o'clock, the giant <coughs> running away, Christ dies, and his soul immediately goes to the center of the earth. And Christ referred to this when he said in one of his talks at the temple, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. You think our Lord was a, was a skeptic <coughs> modernist who said that Jonah and the whale was a myth? No, he refers directly. Christ who is truth would not refer to some myth. It 
It's a historic fact. He refers to Adam and Eve. He refers to the days of creation. The six days of creation. Christ wrote the book of Genesis. He inspired it to Moses. He himself refers to it many times. And he refers directly to Jonah. And Christ goes to the belly of the earth. That is, the levels of hell. We say in the creed, he descended into hell. And on the third day he rose again from the dead. So there are levels of hell. Of course, the center is the level of the damned. They never escape. The level of purgatory is second. They are purged by fire. And after their purging, they, before Christ opened the gates of heaven at the ascension, they had to wait in the place, the highest level of, of hell, which is called the limbo of the fathers. The limbo of the fathers. <coughs> so there's no suffering there. And it's a place of natural and supernatural happiness, because they have the state of grace. But they don't yet see the beatific vision. But they know they will. So already they have a deeply entrenched expectation and joy to see the Divine Redeemer. So our Lord at 3 o'clock comes to the gates of Limbo. And as the scripture says, He takes the gates and tears them open. The second Samson who tore open the gates of the city of Gaza as the soldiers surrounded the city and they thought, we'll capture Samson in the book of Judges. We'll capture him now. And Samson comes out in the middle of the night, early in the morning, tears the gates, tears the bolts and the bars right out of the concrete, and picks up the gates with all his strength, carries them up the hill, and throws them down in victory. So Christ, Samson, says St. Gregory the Great, prefigured Jesus Christ the King, who, surrounded by soldiers on that Easter morning, some say up to a hundred soldiers guarded the tomb, paid for by the wealthy chief priests and the Jews. And the Jews ended up paying for the first witnesses of the resurrection. And these Roman guards guarded the tomb, just as they guarded the, the Philistines guarded the city of Samson, and Christ, the true second Samson, breaks out from the tomb. Now, the scripture says, the angel came. And very early on the first day of the week, this is St. Mark chapter 16, verse, verse 2. They came to the tomb, that is, St. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome, who brought spices. And very early in the morning, first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had just risen. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll the stone back from the entrance of the tomb for us? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, for it was very large. And on entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right hand, clothed in a white robe, and they were amazed. And then St. Luke says that this angel, St. Matthew, rather, says, that this angel took that stone and violently ripped it out from the wall. Because remember, the stone was not, was sealed. It was sealed with iron bars that were drilled in manually into the side of the rock. And then the, they pounded in nails, four or five nails, and then sealed it with the wax and seals that no one was to go in, and the guards were to guard it. And they said, because the apostles could come, take the body and say, see, he rose from the dead. So the apostles were scared like mice. They didn't come out. But the, so the guards were there. And listen to what the commentary of Father Cornelius de Lapide, quoting and drawing from the fathers of the church. This is what he says. He says that, the angel sat upon the rock after moving it. Christ and his body, his soul, and his body just passed through the rock. But the angel was the one to throw it down and sit on it. And why did he sit on it? He says that he might terrify the soldiers 
as if to say, you armed men are watching the sepulchre to guard it, so that Christ enclosed within it, so to speak, might not be able to rise again. Behold, I, a heavenly messenger, have reopened it and shown that against your will, Christ has risen from the tomb while it was still closed. Come to me if you dare and attack me. Sitting in security, I await you. And if you approach, I will prostrate you all with a light touch and crush you like fleas. So says Father Cornelius Alapide. So the, the, the soldiers actually saw the light of the angel. And St. Mary Magdalene and the women were on their way, and this is what she saw. And they felt the tremendous earthquake at the uh, resurrection of Christ. And this already woke up the soldiers. Then they see the angel smash the rock, throw it down, and sit on it with dazzling light. And they are, says the, the Holy Ghost, they are prostrate to the ground, paralyzed in fear. These are grown men, these are tough soldiers, and they're shaking. And when they come to their senses, they race off to the Pharisees and say, Give us our pain. We just witnessed it. We don't know how, we don't know how to explain it, but nobody took the body, but it's empty. So our Lord, He, he goes down first, to the fathers. Now the chronology is this. Let's briefly summarize it. Christ began his sacred passion on Good Friday, 9 p.m. we could say, and then died on the cross 3 p.m. on Good Friday, 18 hours of agony in the passion. And then 3 p.m. on Good Friday till Easter Sunday at 3 a.m. Christ is in limbo of the Father for 36 hours. For 36 hours, he is there. And he, he brings to limbo his divine light. And they all prostrate and adore him, just like we do at the canon of the Mass. And they come and kiss his sacred hands and his sacred feet. Of course, it's his soul. And they adore him. And he brings such a joy to limbo. And then at 6 p.m. on Good Friday, 6 p.m., 5 or 6 p.m., Christ's body is laid in the sepulchre and sealed there and will rise physically at 3 a.m. on Easter morning. So he's 33 hours, his body is in the sepulchre. So from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. on Easter morning, 9 p.m. Holy Thursday night, to 3 a.m. Easter morning, that's 54 hours. That's two days and four hours. The Blessed Virgin Mary went through the entire Passion over and over again. So she suffered so much. St. Bernardine Siena of Siena says that if the Virgin Mary were to parcel out to each person on this earth right now, and equally share it among all the men on this earth of the human race, all of us would die from grief. We couldn't take the sorrow that she suffered. And that's the intensity of the suffering she went through. So Our Lady, all Good Friday night, she never slept. All Holy Saturday, she goes back and she walks through the whole path of the Passion. That's why when we do the Stations of the Cross, we're just following the devotion of the Virgin Mary. She's the first to do it. She walked through it on Holy Saturday, and probably more than once. And then the Blessed Virgin Mary on Saturday night, maybe, maybe late, maybe late, she finally fell asleep. And then by early in the morning, on Easter morning, 3 a.m., our Lord comes to visit her first. This is not recorded in the Gospels, but it is part of tradition. And according to the Mary of Agreda, it was the Virgin Mary herself who asked her name and her, 
herself to be effaced from the Gospels, so that Christ receives all the glory and honor. But nevertheless, the apostles always venerated this fact, that Christ first appears to the Blessed Mother. And this is what St. Ignatius has us meditate on in this uh, in his exercises on page 101. This is what he says. The first prelude is the history. Here it is how Christ expired on the cross, and his body remains separated from the soul, yet always united with the divinity. His soul likewise united with the divinity, descended into hell, the limbo. There he released the souls of the just, then returning to the sepulchre, and rising again, he appeared in body and soul to his blessed mother. Second prelude is the mental examination of the place. Here will be to see the arrangement of the holy sepulchre and the place or house of Our Lady, noting its different rooms, likewise her room, her oratory. So most likely Our Lady is in a room adjacent to the upper room where, all the, where the Last Supper was. That was kind of the, the place of the whole meeting. And that's where during uh, Good Friday night, Holy Saturday, all day and then Holy Saturday night, that's where the apostles came to gather around the Virgin Mary. They came like, like um, lost chicks finding their mother. And they came to the Blessed Virgin Mary. They gathered around her. So she was already gathering her hands under her wings, that is the apostles. So early in the morning, she is in her room. The third prelude is to ask for what I desire. Here it will be to request the grace that I might feel intense joy and gladness for the great glory and joy of Christ our Lord. The first, second, and third points are the same that we have had in the contemplation of the Last Supper. Consider the divinity which seemed to hide itself during the Passion, now appears and manifests itself so miraculously in the most holy resurrection by its true and most holy effects. So the one grace to ask in this meditation is the joy. To taste the joy of our Lord, to taste the joy of the saints of Limbo, to taste the joy especially of the Virgin Mary, when Christ comes to her. So Our Lady, like a wilted lily flattened to the ground after a massive hurricane has passed through, she's flattened. She's, she's, she's finally sleeping. And then early in the morning a light fills her room. And she's wakened by the song of angels. And she wakes up gently in the brightness of the light she can't see clearly. But then she opens her eyes more and she sees standing before her, surrounded by armies of angels, Christ the King, her divine Son. And her sorrow is instantly turned to joy. And how can, how can any priest possibly explain, or even try to explain, what took place at this meeting? How tremendous the meeting on the way of the cross. We can't comprehend that either. When Jesus and Mary saw each other as he went to Calvary. And now he's risen from the dead. Now he's the lion of the tribe of Judah who has crushed Satan. Conquered death. Conquered sin. And he now is the, the warrior who will lead all those who follow him on the way of the cross. And drench in his blood. And come to his sacred heart and love him above all things, and strive to keep in his commandments, and die in his sanctifying grace, he will snatch them from hell forever. And they will reign with him forever in heaven. So the Virgin Mary rises and falls to her knees before her divine Son. But he picks her up, and he holds the Blessed Mother, embraces his mother, this, this poor virgin, pure and beautiful, wilted, Lily, he holds her, and she once again feels his heart beating as she did when he was a baby, as she did when he held him, but she didn't, help, she didn't feel the heartbeat at the foot of the cross. And now her, his heart beats and burns with divine love for his mother, with what respect that Christ had for his mother. And Christ, you know, he wrote the Ten Commandments. It was his finger that wrote the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai that shook the mountain. 
And now, one of those commandments is honor your father and mother. And Christ the King, he goes first to honor his mother. Of course he would. And he works the first miracle through his mother. Everything through his mother. And he wants us poor sinners to come, children of wrath. He wants us to come to him through his mother. So he holds his mother and just embraces her. There's no words. There can't be words. They can't express words that can express the love of the sacred heart and the most pure heart of Mary. There's no words exchanged between them. No words. But everything is said in a language and a dimension we will never understand. But the Virgin Mary, she, some of the fathers say that Christ brought with him from limbo St. David, St. Moses, uh, um, Abraham, and Isaac, and some of the other great names of the Old Testament. Some of the fathers say he brought them with him to introduce them to his mother. And she would have uh, greeted them. So Our Lady, this meeting of Christ and the Mother of God, I'm not even going to try to go longer to explain it. We can just fall on our knees and adore this mystery. And ask Our Lady, please, Blessed Mother, my heart is stone cold. I hardly love you. I have a hard enough time keeping your commandments. My mind is not always focused on heaven. I'm more interested in this world than in the joys of heaven. Please, Blessed Mother, give me one spark of your divine heart. Just catch some of my cold, stony heart. Catch it on fire. At least melt my ice. At least thaw my ice so it can begin to look a little bit like a human flesh that really beats with love for its king and its mother. We've got to ask this. We've got to beg this. And this is what the world is starving for now, is men on fire with the love of God. If St. Bernard could take 30 men to the monastery and they, be, they all became canonized saints, blessed and venerable, every one of them persevered. And they transformed medieval Europe. St. Bernard shook Europe. He preached the first crusades. He, he fired up these men to go fight the Muslims, as was called by the Pope, because the Muslims were massacring Catholics, burning the ladies, raping them, skinning them alive. Of course, and it's happening, it's going to be happening, and it's happening again now in Europe. May we have someday a Pope who will again call a great crusade to drive them out of Christendom. But the world needs saints and men on fire with the love of God. Women need men on fire with the love of God. Women need this because usually they follow the men. St. Clair took all her girls to follow St. Francis. St. Scholastica took all her women to follow St. Benedict, her brother. That's usually how it goes. And Saint Archbishop Lefebvre, he's not a saint yet, but I'm, I know someday he'll be canonized. But he fought for the faith. He defended tradition. He stood up against the whole world and even the Pope. And his sisters followed him. One sister was a Carmelite nun, followed him to defend tradition. Another sister started the whole order of the nuns of the Society of Pius X. The girls follow. And the men, you've got to lead. Your wives need you to be pillars of fire. Fire on the love of God. Burning with the love of God and zeal for his glory and the salvation of souls. Not just your family and your children and your wife, but your neighbors, your co-workers. You've got to see your example. The world needs this. And out of you, may God raise up at least some, a handful of generous Men who will give up the beauty of an earthly wife, and that's a massive sacrifice. We all know that. And to give up the joys of having your own business and so, and so forth, your own way of doing things, and to come and serve Christ the King as a priest, as a monk, as a brother, and help there. As one man said, how do we know God's will? Look around and see where the most need is. There's God's will. And what is more needed now in this age of apostasy than for men to hold up high the torch of the Catholic light 
the faith, the fire alone that can melt this ice of this age gone cold without charity. And it's a rejection of Christ the King. We need men who will hi hold high that flag, that standard of the Holy Catholic faith. And that will stand in the line of Archbishop Lefebvre and not compromise and not go soft and not make deals and turn into wet noodles seeking recognition from the wolves destroying our Catholic Church. They want Re Bishop Fillet wants recognition from these wolves, these destroyers, these foxes who want to bring in all the chickens of the SSPX and just tear them up. And it's happening before our eyes. Six years of it, it's happening. But it's done in the most clever way. The old system of boil the frogs very slowly. Make it nice and long. Make them think they're in a nice jacuzzi. And that's what most of the priests are thinking. It's a big jacuzzi. And we'll get recognized and we'll have our Latin Mass and we can preach against modernism and we'll have this and that and that and this and it's all empty promises. Because 11 congregations of priests and nuns have already been swallowed up and their modernists in their sick skulls and their hearts are already cold. They have the new Mass, giving communion in the hand, and defending Vatican II, or bending over backwards to defend it. We don't mean, need wet noodles like that. Our Lord doesn't need noodles like that. Don't be noodles, wet noodles. He has too many of them. But at least be men on fire with the love of God, as weak and poor sinners as we are, give yourself to Our Lady. And Christ the King rose from the dead. Muhammad's rotten, and his soul's in hell. Luther is rotten. His bones are in that grave, and his soul is also in hell. Mormons, <coughs> Joseph Smith, the guy was an absolute joke. He's in hell. He was a Freemason. And all these false religions, they're all false. Only one true king, only one true God, who is right here, living in the tabernacle. Our captain's right here. Here he is. Ask him strength, and ask him to fight, and ask him to spread that fire and to convert your souls and to stand up for the Catholic Church. Our Lady says to at La Salette, My little ones, it is now the hour for you to rise up with my weapons, my rosary, my scapular, and my protection. Rise up and show the light of the Catholic truth with no compromise in the line of our great Captain Archbishop Lefebvre. So may Our Lady give you such a faith that she had. The apostles all lost it, you know. Even St. John who stood at the foot of the cross, he went the farthest, but even he lost the faith. But if we stand next to Our Lady, you're going to be strong in the faith. May she strengthen you and make you true soldiers of her divine Son. And may you fight to the death and give your blood and give your sweat. And may our Lord himself look you in the eye and crown you and save well done, EUJ, serve bone. Well done, good and faithful servant. May such joy be yours to Our Lady. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us and have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us and have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us and have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.